Hi, everybody. Good evening. Welcome to Evoke Therapy Program's broadcast. My name is Dr. Brad Reedy, and tonight we are going over one of my very favorite books in, in self-help, mental health. It's a story. It's a sequel to The Knight in Rusty Armor. I'm going to spend just a couple of minutes recapping The Knight in Rusty Armor, but then I'm going to go right into the sequel. This sequel was written in 1993 and given as a series of lectures by my therapist, J.D. Gill. Her author name is J.D. Gill. And it was given to me around 2012 as a series of papers. And when I read them, I was so moved by them. I asked J.D. if she'd be willing to publish them in a book so that people could buy them instead of just me sharing her papers. And so she went ahead and did that for us. It's something we share out in the field with your children. It's something we do at our intensives. So let me get right into it. Let's start with just a really basic recap of the Knight in Rusty Armor. The Knight in Rusty Armor is about a knight who can't get off his armor, who can't take off his armor because he's been wearing it so much that it's become impossible to move. And his wife, who gets frustrated with him, decides that she's going to give him an ultimatum that if you don't take off that armor, I'm going to leave and take our child with us. And so he goes on a quest to get his armor first. First, he goes to the blacksmith. The blacksmith can't remove it. His wife doesn't even think he's trying. And then he goes to the king and he finds out the king has gone on a crusade. And so then he's told by the, the court jester at the king's palace that if he goes into the forest and finds the magician, the, the, the wizard Merlin, that he'll be able to, to get the, the armor off. He'll be able to help him get the armor off. So he goes into the forest. He finds Merlin at the end of his desperation. And Merlin tells him that he has to walk the path of truth and go through three castles. And so he goes through these three castles and along the way he's grieving and, and looking back on his life and at various times he's crying inside of his armor and at each point in the story various parts of the armor fall off rust and fall off right first the visor then the helmet then then some of the other pieces until at the very end he he cries the last little bit and all the armor falls off and he says just as the story ends, I neither, I almost died from all the tears I left unshed. So that's the night's journey. And then Jamie Gill decided to, to write a sequel about the wife who was left behind. And this book is called The Letters of Juliet to the Night in Rusty Armor. So that's the backdrop. Some of you might recognize that my epigraph of my book, The, the Audacity to Be You, which is so largely a, a product of my work with Jamie Gill, starts off with this epigraph from the Letters of Juliet. It says, why were we, each of us, taught the notions we had been taught about being correct when those exact notions ensured our, our failure in the world? So this idea, the, 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 the audacity to be you learning to love your horrible, rotten self is really becoming aware of our own woundedness, to become aware of, my therapist playfully called it, our horrible, rotten selves. And, and while we might go out into the forest, which becomes a metaphor for this part of us, right? What's inside our head, the forest or the caves or the ocean, the frightening place in storytelling to go is representative of going inside. That's where the heroic journey is. While we might go to that forest to, to find our husband as Juliet was doing, she wanted to find out if he was as terrible as she remembered. Or while we go into the forest, to, to save our children, to go after our children, to save them. We end up in webinars and podcasts like this. We end up in parent support groups and parent workshops like this, thinking that we're going to save our children. What really happens for us is we become transformed ourselves. And that transformation makes us, makes it possible for us to love those in our life that we love with more capacity. So that's the hero's journey. That's that's Juliet's journey. That's the night's journey. That's our journey. That's what brought you here tonight. Or if you're listening on the podcast app, that's what brought you here listening. So we, we start to see early on in, in Juliet's letters, the four letters that she wrote, blame. We need to cut the link between accountability, mistakes, and even cause and, and, and the idea of cause from shame, right? This work that I teach is not about laying heavy burdens on top of you. It's about removing them removing the shame and guilt. But to do that, we have to cut in our minds the idea of being imperfect, of being a self, essentially, a human, a fallible, limited human, and shame and guilt. And that takes a re-experiencing ourselves in the presence of an empathic other. 
That's how we learn we're okay. We, we experience ourselves. The child experiences their not okayness in the presence of an anxious, angry, upset, disappointed, frustrated parent. Then it's peers and teachers that have their say at it. So we have to find a place to go. And in the Nine Rusty Armor, it's Merlin. And in the Letters of Juliet, it's Marith. We have to re-experience ourselves to, to unpair, to unlink the accountability, our mistakes from shame. The Letters of Juliet is really ends up being a, a letter of accountability. In this case, from a, a wife to a husband. There is a um, an assignment in our curriculum that some parents get to where they write a letter of accountability that they may or may not share with their children. It's a letter that essentially says, here's my contribution. Here's how I hurt you. And when I ask or invite parents to write that letter, historically, they have one objection to it. And the objection is, I don't want to because I'm afraid they're going to use it against me. But what we learn about accountability, what we learn about self-love and compassion is it's impossible. We're not asking for anything back. And we're not removing accountability for the child's behavior. Just because I dented my children, and by the way, I dented my children. It doesn't mean I can't hold them accountable to certain behaviors and have boundaries. Send them to evoke, for example, which two of my children have been to. I can do both. But I've got to get out of that mindset of power and control, of right and wrong, right? Because in the, in the power and control paradigm, if I own my contribution, then they can say, well, you can't then hold me accountable. You can't send me to a vote because it's your fault. But in this shift in paradigms, I can say, it is. I'm the one who did most of the denting, but now the dents are yours. And both of those things can be true. So we, we exercise vulnerability, but we've really got to heal our own childhood wounds, right? We've got to heal the part of us that thinks that we need to be good, the part of us that imagines that we could be good and right all the time. And there's another way of thinking about this. It's not good nor bad, really. You know, I hear parents say all the time, my, my, they'll talk about somebody hurting them. Children will say this to me. They'll talk about somebody hurting them or doing something unkind to them. And they'll say, I know they had the best of intentions. And I'll often step in and say, they didn't have good intentions and they weren't bad intentions either. But that idea, they just meant well, or they just had good intentions is a way of protecting the, the parents or the other person's defense to be good. And the reason that people act out on us is because they, they themselves have unhealed wounds and they're really just trying to manage that. Often it's anxiety and fear. So in this shift in paradigm that the letters of Juliet, the letters of Juliet demonstrates, we get out of the old ideas that we all grew up with. We become a student in this process, all of us, and we grow. We allow the old things to die in us and the new things to arise. So let's talk about, first of all, for just a minute, the idea that we learned from the Nine Rusty Armor. One of the idea was, at first, some of the ideas can be insulting to us, right? You'll notice a characteristic of enlightened people that they're able to laugh at themselves. It's one of the signs of mental health, is not taking yourself too seriously. We need to learn to look at instruction, correction, coaching with the, without the sense of being corrected, or criticized, or punished. In the Knight in Rusty Armor, after Merlin playfully points out the knight's follies, the knight responds defensively. And this is from the Knight in Rusty Armor. The knight climbed off his horse. I've been looking for you. I've been lost for months. You've been lost all of your life, corrected Merlin. The knight stiffened. I didn't come all this way to be insulted. Perhaps you have always taken the truth to be an insult, said Merlin. And you can get away with this in a story that you couldn't get away with in a session, of course. 
but it illustrates, it demonstrates for us that we, we have this need to protect an idea of who we think we should be. The word should is a fascinating word in our, in our brains, in our minds, in our mouth. As we grow in our mental health and awareness, the word should disappears. We don't think in terms of should and shouldn't anymore. We think in terms of can or can't. We shift the paradigm from being good and right to just being a person who has limits. I told you one time that my therapist, I don't know if I said this last time or not, but I've said it before, that my therapist, I was, I was confessing that I was not a very good father to young children because I couldn't play make-believe. And my children all like to play make-believe. And I was just giving this story and comparing myself to my wife and to a friend that was visiting. My therapist had the audacity to agree with me. She said, yeah, you're not very good at that. And I remember initially being offended at that. I just spent the session telling her it was true. And then she mirrored it back to me, reflected it back, and I took offense to it. But I, but I learned, I knew what she was trying to do. She said, it's okay. It's neither here nor there. And then she pointed out, you're really good with teens. You're really good at taking even your young children and doing projects, you know, working in the backyard with them or taking them to Home Depot even taking them grocery shopping. You love doing that. When there's a crisis, especially around mental health and, and especially during the teenage years, you're a champion, but you're not very good at this. And then we talked about where that wounding came from that I couldn't play make-believe. I, I've said this, the virus on planet Earth, the psychological virus on planet Earth is that children are being asked to take care of parents. The children need to be a certain way for parents to have happiness and serenity. And we've become confused about that idea. We've become confused to think that that's about love. We know now that a parent's serenity is their responsibility. That a parent's anger is their responsibility, their sadness that their life is their responsibility and that their first responsibility is to work on themselves, to make their life their project. And we become confused. I, I think we're becoming less confused about it, but, but Juliet demonstrates this just after the night, after the night leaves and she decides she's going to go look for him. She says this, she says, Juliet says, my mother came to stay but your son only cried and was very cold to her. I must say the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. I've tried to comfort him, but he always, test, he always tested the limits and ended up hurting everybody's feelings. Perhaps it is a male trait. I think one of the things that, that I woke up to in my adult life was I didn't want to let my mother abuse my children the way that she had abused me in this way. You have a young boy and it's not his job to love grandma when she comes. It's not his job. He's lost his father. He's scared. He's confused. And even grandmother, Juliet's mother's visit, is about taking care of mother. We ask our children to show up to our parents to take care of them in the ways that we were required to because we did it. And it's not their job. And sometimes that can be, become very clear to us. In letter one, we see the anger that Juliet has, right? That often becomes the impetus for seeking treatment. She says, ever since you saw fit to leave your son and me, so you wouldn't have to take off that ridiculous armory you love so much, I've been trying to pick up the pieces of my life. She has anger. She doesn't know that it's anger. She'll find that out later. She just thinks she's right. She feels righteous with her anger. There's obviously judgment there. My friends from the neighboring castles were quick to agree with me, and you may be sure you will probably have a tough, tough time of it when or if you return to these parts. And then she uses a technique in communications theory called recruiting. When we can't stand in our own truth, when we can't just say, this is how I feel, this is my experience, we talk about everybody else thinks that way too. This is what people think. This is what women think. This is what men think. This is what Dr. Reedy thinks. This is what Matt Hoig thinks, right? This is what Judith Sedora thinks. She says this, my mother came to stay, but your son only cried. 
and I already read that and it was very cold to her. The recruiting is in the, the, the friends from the neighboring castles. We blame the identified patient for our reactions, right? It's their fault. We, our anger is just a natural reaction to them. And that's how they're going to learn their place in the world is when they take responsibility for the feelings they've caused in us, right? That's what we do. After mother left, Juliet says in letter one, Sir Jeffrey, our neighbor, whose wife died in childbirth two, two years ago, remember, began to pass the evenings with us. I think he was taken with me, and I confess I began to think of having an affair with him. He thoughtfully brought baubles and, and small casks, casks of wine. Once even when he was leaving, he grabbed me and kissed me. I nearly lost my breath. It had been so long since you and I had made love, but I was confused and pushed him away. Like the rest of you, he went off that night and hasn't been around since. So there's the, there's a blame, there's an anger. And then our culture, I mean, this is what I talked about last week on the broadcast about challenging the notions of what it means to be a, a, a good parent, an effective parent, an adequate parent. Juliet says, I can't decide what to do. My friends tell me to forget you and get on with my life, but I keep remembering little things about you, times we shared when we were happy when life was full and wonderful. I remember bathing with you in that forest pool, how you held me and how good it felt. Right? There, there's a shift that she's having where she's starting to realize that the advice that the culture is giving her might not be her heart's desire and there might be something to this thing. And then we keep ourselves distant from the problem, right? This is about the identified patient. This is about the child. This is about the, the spouse. I don't have a part in this. When she says, I hope you're well and we can work this out, mess out soon. And you see in the first letter, it's dear sir at the beginning and regards Juliet. And then we get to letter two, there's four letters. We find excuses to stay out of the forest, to not go to Al-Anon, to not go to therapy, to not attend webinars, to not do assignments. Juliet says it was harder than I imagined being away from Christopher. Many days I thought the longing I had for him would tear me apart and put an end to my crazy journey, for I got lost and crazy indeed in the woods. The woods are frightening places to go. We're afraid of what we will find. I think, among other things I've been thinking lately, that we're afraid that we might not have the answers. We're afraid that we might be part of the problem, that our happiness might have something to do with the way that we're living we're, we're living our life. We're afraid because we were taught to be afraid to look inward. She said her friends urged her not to go. They don't like you anyway. More recruiting. They wanted to plan a summer's feast, and I often wish I had listened to them. My paths were paths of futility. I got lost no matter where I went. The sounds of the woods scared me, and I doubted I would ever survive. I got hungry and sick. There's this idea that happens often in therapy where somebody says, I'm worse off now than when I began. And Jamie Gill teaches this idea, you only think you're worse off. What you're, what you're doing is you're becoming aware. And, and that will feel like an unraveling. It's like the parent who said to me, when you presented an idea that I, I believed to be true, that challenged a really core notion that I had held as a parent, I realized everything was up for grabs and it was terrifying. That's what therapy does for us. Even, even um, the, the TED talk that Brene Brown gave, that, that's had millions and millions of listeners, she said, I thought I was having a nervous breakdown and my therapist said, I was having a spiritual rebirth, a spiritual awakening. Something I say in therapy is when pa parents or people, for that matter, tell me they had a pretty normal, pretty good childhood, I tell them therapy can fix that. Right? We understand. We look back on our dance and we, we challenge a terrifying dragon that we challenge that guards us looking back on our past are the messages we hear from our parents, right? You're being a victim. It's a waste of time. You should move forward. 
You're looking for excuses. That's our parents' voice. And it's their defense. If a parent were capable, the voice in our heads would be, please tell me that how I hurt you. Please tell me how I dented you. You need to, and I need to hear it. I can hear it. And I can be okay. I can take care of myself. In the heroic journey, one of the stages is crossing the threshold where we leave the sensibility that we are in, that, that we were raised in, and we consider crossing over into a new land. Juliet says at this threshold crossing, I fell into despair. I couldn't find my way back or I would have gone immediately. I was lost and terrified. I don't know if you've ever felt this feeling or not, but it was awful. I could not imagine continuing anywhere. My life seemed, seemed a long series of failures. Every impulse I had had been futile. I fell by the side of the mountain meadow where I knew I would die. I sobbed and sobbed for Christopher, for my friends, my mother and father, the Duke and Duchess, and for my older sisters I had not seen in so many years. I even sobbed for you and for the failure our dreams have been. It is a devastating grief. It doesn't have to be, by the way, but it is for many of us because we're, we're, we're confronting everything we were told about life. Therapy is hard. I, the reason I love the story of the Letters of Juliet and the Nine Rusty Armor is because the, the story evokes a, a feeling, a sense, right? That's what metaphors do. That's what parables do. They give us a sense. They don't directly confront our defenses. What I'm doing tonight confronts it more directly, but the story doesn't. If it's too much for us to hear, in fact, a lot of people have told me after reading the letters of Juliet, they didn't, under, it was nothing. It didn't even, they couldn't even, it seemed like a silly story that didn't make any sense. I've heard that a lot. And in my life, in my work, the more work I've done, I realize every single chapter, every single paragraph is meaningful. I was just telling a group about this, that I'd said that recently, that every paragraph was meaningful. And then I felt that like, that's a pretty high bar. I wonder if it's true. And I was reading it with them along with them. And I came to this, this part where uh, Juliet had met her guide named Marie. And when she met her guide, she, she said, we went back to her, her temple, but sometimes it looked like a temple and sometimes it just looked like a roof on poles. Because depending upon our perspective, the therapist's office changes. Sometimes it just looks like a room. I don't even get it. And sometimes it's a place I go to find my highest truth, a temple. At her weakest point, the teacher appears. I fell by the side of a mountain meadow where I knew I would die, sobbed and sobbed for Christopher. I already read that. As I was lying there, the strangest thing happened to me. A woman, I am not certain, still not certain whether or not she was an apparition, appeared beside me. A strange, safe light around her. The light was white and pale blue. Who are you? I asked, amazed. I am Marith, she replied. Take a drink from my cup. I am the woman of the woods, she said, and I have, a lot, I have come to you in a form you can comprehend. When I sat down, Marith poured out a glass of crystal water for me and said, you are well aware of the knight's armor. Are you also aware of your own? Her new encounter was confusing and caused her fear. Whatever it was, it was enchanted, and I feared for my life, she said. A dreary death of misery is to be preferred, she said. I thought to some, di to, to, to some diabolical end at the hands of evil spirit. It's frightening. Now, th this is metaphor, right? Way, the way it sounds is therapy is stupid. Therapy is navel-gazing. Therapy is a waste of time. Right? That's what it sounds like. But Juliet, through her letter, is giving us a sense of the more, the deeper psychic energy beneath our resistance. She said, I decided to run away. Actually, I decided this almost every day I was with Marie. This reminds me of the, the, the myth of Psyche and, and Eros. And how in, in Psyche's attempt to get Eros back, she was given insurmountable challenges. And she considered suicide at every step. 
it seemed overwhelming to her. Because sometimes we feel like there's no way to win, there's no, there's no way to succeed at it. We may begin the journey by finding the other. We go into the woods to find the other. So after much thought, I've decided to try to find you. Maybe we can talk. I have to settle this once and for all. I don't know where you are, though I've been told you went back and went back into the woods. I am terribly afraid of those woods, as you know, but I want to find you and see if you really are as impossible and close as I remember, or just did I invent it? The, the gift, so many people tell me this, and it's hard for people when they're new to, to hear this, but so many people tell me this. In fact, everybody who does their work tells me that although they wouldn't wish this dilemma with this child on them, it's been a gift because it's brought them into an awareness that they never would have found if not for this dilemma. You can hear my, my loud Rhodesian Ridgeback dog in the background. She was asked to consider her own armor. She thought she had none. She said, I sometimes wish I had some. I replied, oh, you have some. Marith replied, you have some, and it is perhaps greater, but at least more dangerous than the knights. She said, I was a bit insulted by these words, but decided to listen more. That's kind of what I'm doing, right? The, the, one of my favorite things that a codependent person said to a loved one who was sick with, with addiction, a great gift that this person gave to that person is they, they visited him in, in a hospital where their life was hanging in the balance. And they said, I am just as sick as you. My codependency is just as sick as you. And it took years for this person to realize that. And of course, the person sitting in the bed didn't understand and couldn't see it and have, had come to believe, to accept that they were the only sick one in the family. Going farther to, to explore her anger, Juliet says, I don't know what it is. I don't know what my armor is. Excuse me. What is it? My worry? Your anger is your armor, was Marit's reply. My anger? I was astounded. I don't see myself as angry, I stressed. I know, said Marith, and that is part of the problem. You see everyone's armor but your own. Your anger covers up your fear. Think back, she says. Marith says to Juliet, think back to when you gave your knight your demand. Either you take off that armor, or I will take the child and leave, you said. He deserved it. He was ignoring me. I rest my case, said Marith. What if he had said, get rid of your anger, or I will take the child and leave? I would have told him to take a royal hike, I exclaimed. Well, can you hear it yet? My patient friend said with an almost eerie grin. I had to admit the idea began to have some weight with me, though I had never considered it before. Somehow she was weaving some magic or something because ordinarily I would have fought for my own position. This is the time in therapy when the therapist's ideas and suggestions begin to take weight in you. When you lower the defense enough, you let them in enough, you trust them enough, and they can articulate it in such a way that you start to consider it. She said, strangely, I didn't feel like defending myself. I, I wanted to try, I almost wanted to try something new. I confess, I never thought of myself as being especially angry before. I just thought of the world as sadly out of balance, tilting in an unfair way. This paragraph, I never thought of myself as especially angry before. I thought the world was just sadly out of balance, tilting in an unfair way. I share with people when I share this, that hit me one day when I was, I was on a five and a half hour bike ride. I was riding a hundred miles, riding my bike a hundred miles every Saturday, several years ago. And about two hours into my ride, I realized I'd spent about an hour and 55 minutes focusing on my anger at someone in my life. And I realized that he wasn't there. It had nothing to do with him and it wasn't burdening him, but it was ruining my life. And I realized I was going to have to do something. I was going to have to be responsible for the anger that I felt. And I couldn't just make it about him. So what do you do? How do you get through this? The first step is to let go of your crusades. Marith explains your expectation, your endless trying to make your life work to get rid of your fear your, su your successes in the social club and simply sit with, your sit with yourself alone so your true life can find a way to contact you. My true life? 
Juliet replies. The one you discover within you, rather than the one you construct outside by your own effort. Just sit with myself. Just sit here by the stream. How long will this take? Until the waters are able to give you a true reflection. It's a therapy is this. Meditation can be this. It's a place that we go and we sit with ourselves until we can see ourselves. It's why when people come to me considering divorce, considering sending their child to a program, I explain to them, that's not the question. That decision will come out of the question of who are you? What do you want? And and as a therapist, it can become to consider the question of what should I do? But as a therapist, we have to uh, continue to resist answering that question and shifting the question back to who are you? Can I be that stream that you sit by? Or you find yourself? And then when you find yourself, you'll know if you should stay married or not or send your child away or not. That'll be your decision. I can't possibly find it, but I can be here to help you find it. I love this line from the letters of Juliet from this letter. She said, I saw it was true deep down beneath it all. I feared everything. My old life closed. Letter three. She begins with my dearest night. I'm afraid I have lost you because I tried to force you to join that club to agree with it. I hope I haven't crippled our son. My tears are endless. I didn't know anything before. I am writing to you through my tears. I have cried so much. I don't know who I am anymore. One thing is sure. I am not who I thought I was when I tried to live by my own efforts. In this work, I find over and over and over again that people people say all the time, my old friends and my old conversations just don't make sense anymore. The old way that I thought doesn't make sense anymore. And it's hard to articulate the distance that you've traveled. There's a saying in analysis that once you've been in analysis for so many years, you can't talk to anybody else who hasn't been in analysis because it doesn't make sense. You all know that a little bit. Even if you're pretty new to this process, you recognize that some of your old conversations don't make sense anymore. Somebody recently told me, as they've been at the work for many years, that they're trying to find their tribe. They're trying to find their people. Because the old conversations and relationships don't make sense. And what I found in my life, as I made this shift, and for me, this this the big shift happened, happened about 10 years ago, 8 years ago. Still, still a growing process, but there was a big shift, big turn at that point in my life. I lost people. I lost half of Evoke Therapy programs in the deal. I lost people I didn't think I was going to lose. And some people stepped up in my life in ways I didn't expect. They weren't all, I couldn't have predicted beforehand who was going to be there for me. And I found new people. So this metaphor of the of the new self is very, very real. You have to challenge what you've been told and been taught. Juliet says, I even began to feel my mother, poor woman, had been my warden. Yes, she kept me from being myself and forced me again and again to fit in. My school friends and the ladies of the castle each agreed. Ours was a difficult lot, they said. Only by sticking together could we find real support in our alien world. I would have done anything they asked just to keep from being kicked out of the club. I can see now I never should have joined. I should have never listened to them. I joined their club instead of joining life. This is a a critique on the dominant culture. My wife told me when we were going through both of our big transitions in our life and our marriage that she found she had to stop talking to certain people because the advice that they were giving, the wisdom that they were giving didn't make sense. And she started to find people, our therapists and certain people who had a different kind of wisdom, a deeper wisdom. And a wisdom that that didn't suggest that they knew what she should do in her life. And I found the same thing. I love this line in letter three. 
I, I think this line is just beautiful. Juliet says, I realize that what we do to stay safe wounds others. That's all it is. That's all it is. The things that our children and the things that others do that hurt us are their defenses. And the defenses are in place to protect them from old wounds or from potential future wounds. Wounds. As she sat, she says, suddenly one day I saw life laid out, laid out all about me, like the air I was breathing. I realized that it was life itself that mattered, simply life itself, Christopher and you. And then this line, I repeat this next line every day of my life since I've read this, this book. I hear my daughter, who's a training to be a therapist, repeat it out loud too. I repeat it with my children, with my wife, and with my clients, with the therapists that, that I train and supervise. The line goes like this. This is Juliet speaking. Nothing needs me to rearrange it, shape it up to my own advantage, triumph over it. Nothing needs me to rearrange it. One of the things that I teach and train the therapists over and over again, just hear and understand. Let the client and the mother and father re-experience and re-experience themselves in you as beautiful, whole people, wise people, who sometimes have wounds that, that get in the way of them realizing their potential, of them seeing their own potential. Juliet muses, and this is about surrender, was that my great error? Had I been forever lost in trying to arrange my life my way to make it turn out the way I wanted so my own dreams would come true? So I had not seen that life had more important things to do than pay attention to my dreams? And weren't my dreams, my attempt to be something or somewhere I was not, rather than accepting what or where I was? Then I realized what had happened between us. I saw your arm and was in the way. Think about that with your child. I saw your arm and was in the way but I did not see my expectations were in the way just the same. My anger at you when you wouldn't do what I wanted left you out as surely as your armor left me out. What a generous, generous sentiment. That night, Juliet said, I had a dream. I was summoned to the great hall of women. There I was led before a large group of my women, all of whom began shrieking at me for my betrayal of them. They accused me of abandoning my pledge to keep them first. The unthinkable began to occur to me. I would leave them. I sobbed in an uncontrollable attempt to cleanse my whole life. It's when we make the shift and decide that we're not going to accept what the dominant culture is teaching us. Even when it comes through the mouth, mouth of therapists. One of, my, one of my issues with some self-help literature and some therapists is that it still can be shaming there still can be a should in it, right? There, there still is a, a, a blame in it that's charged with guilt and shame. If a parent isn't doing what a parent needs to do to help their child, guess what? It's because the parent themselves is injured. Because the parent themselves hasn't un, unwound their own dents. So why would we heap on top of a parent more shame and judgment? You know that, that quote that Brene Brown often uses where she talks about, I think she's quoting Teddy Roosevelt, about the, the arena, right? The, 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 the folks in the arena that, that are doing the work, that are really diving into it. And she says, it's not the critic that counts. I see what she's trying to say, but the point is the critic is injured. The critic isn't to somebody to look at with disdain or judgment. I know that that's what we want to do when we get criticized. But a higher level thinking of it is the critic is just wounded too. The critic has compromised themselves because of their background. So how do we answer the critic? Ideally, we answer the critic with love. How do you respond to the narcissist? With love. How do you respond to the borderline? With love. How do you respond to the addict? With love. Johan Hari in his great TED Talk on everything we knew about addiction was wrong, everything we thought we knew about addiction was wrong. I love how he ends it when he says, we've been singing war songs in our fight 
against addiction and we should have been singing love songs all along. But that takes great capacity, great depth. And it's really hard. So we have to work at it. My night, Juliet says, I have done so poorly with my great love for you. Can you forgive me? I've done poorly with Christopher. At this point, I imagine Marie's voice saying, I've done poorly with me. Good therapy is a, an exercise in self-compassion that is modeled to us, for us, by an empathic, capable other. Uh, an other who is, is capable enough to take care of themselves so that they can show up for us. They sit with us so that we can sit with ourselves. They don't get impatient. They don't get eager to fix. If we get upset with them, they apologize and ask how they can help. And we start to experience something very, very different than our earlier experiences where when we got upset or angry or sad or hurt, we were told how we were confused, how we didn't understand people's intentions, how we were being critical. The kind of ability... The kind of accountability that Juliet offers asks nothing in return, needs nothing in return, because it is an accountability in a letter, a series of letters that ends with love. It ends with giving and not asking for anything back. Juliet said, had I focused on outcomes that I had ignored the land of feelings, which com is complete in itself. Letter four. She greets him with my darling. I drifted with Marie th through her houses of dying children, of poor people, racked with pain. I saw eyes grateful for rags and broken things. I saw them pass each other and touch, imploring. She starts to have the capacity to see and feel everything. Earlier in that paragraph, I think she says, I watched, I saw the, the um, houses with the cruelest people having their parties, something along those lines. She started to see the old culture that she had thought was the one to aspire to. She started, started to see of its cruelty. She got in touch with the sacred, a feeling I cannot name twisted in my openness. And I realized I must devote my life to save my life. I no longer wanted to succeed or be on top of anything. I did not want applause. And there's a grief and a letting go. Somehow I can't stop weeping, she says. I am not the wife, the mother, the friend I was before. I have been lifted. I have wept waves of tears for me, for you, for Christopher, and now I am ready to wait with life for what life wants. I saw what it meant. The answer is not to want or need anything. Since we are life, my dear knight, what do we really want or need? We cannot live because we cannot get beyond our wants and needs. That is what love is trying to teach us. We hear so little. I saw my anger had been in the way of letting go. It is truly armor, my knight. It kept me too closed in. For the first time in my life, I felt free and realized how lucky I was that my dreams had not worked out. At one time, she realized and she says, I gave others what I wanted and called it love and caring before. She started to learn what it really meant, what it really was to give. She ends with this, my night, I am quieter. I think about this because so many people think that their greatest gift that they can give to their children is knowledge, information. When really the greatest gift we can give to a, ch to a child is giving them the, the experience of themselves that they're okay. I said to the, the boys when I left the field, the last time I left the field after running a group, running a group for a period of weeks and months. And I had no idea how tearful it was going to be to me. I said, I just want you guys to know that you're okay. You've screwed up, but not more than I have. You've made mistakes, but not more than I have. But you're okay. And I hope you had some experience with me, from me, some experience of me loving you, even in your woundedness and imperfections. And I hope you can carry a little bit of that with you. My night, I am quieter. I wish you the trembling of new leaves in summer. I wish you rain. I wish you the laughter of your son. I wish you all of my heart, which is my life. Dark blood on the rose. 
dark tears on the sunrise, dark peace in the stillness, dark stillness in the sunrise, dark sunrise in the dark time and in the great light. My love, my love, my love, Juliet. The change is difficult to describe. She said, in the time since I met Marie, so much has changed. I scarcely know my name. I can't believe a viewpoint can change so much. It's an invitation to a shift. Everything that I write, everything that I talk about is not to suggest that that the, the book that I wrote, that the workshop that you came to, that the podcast that you listened to is going to fix everything. It's just, just to give you a glimpse of, of that, that place. I told us to the group I worked with recently. I just said, when I finally knew what my therapist was offering me, the woman who wrote this book and 16 other books at this point, when I finally realized what she was giving me, a place where I could be known and loved, or a place where I could be given, given, given grace, I wanted to spend the rest of my life bringing people to that same place. I didn't know it was going to heal parts of me. I thought I needed a tough, a tough schoolmaster. I thought I needed a kick in the pants. I thought I, I needed to be confronted to be threatened or intimidated. I thought I needed to better hone my guilt. I thought that by being offered the kind of grace that Jamie offered me, I thought I would become a worse person. That's what I'd been taught. Like in Les Mis, when the, the, the bishop handed the last of the silver over to Jean Valjean after he had been caught by the police and said, you forgot these. That act symbolize this kind of work in therapy. That act from the bishop to Jean Valjean um, was the, the, the turning point in Jean Valjean's life. And what did he do for the rest of his life? He just simply wanted to give somebody the same thing that had been given to him. So that's all I'm doing. I'm just giving to you what Jamie Gill has given to me. And she tells me all the time she's just giving to me what somebody else gave to her. And when you experience it in the hands of an adequate therapist, when you experience it over time, learning about it on these broadcasts is helpful. Reading about it in the books is helpful because it gives you some sense of what the, what the trip will look like, what the journey will look like. But you have to experience it. We were, we were wounded in relationships, so we heal in relationship. When you experience it, all you're going to want to do is give it to your child and your partner, your spouse and everybody you meet. I'm happy to take any questions. Somebody writes, can you elaborate on how after you apologize, after you apologize as a parent for your part in this, the creating the dents, you and your child can avoid getting stuck in the mom and dad, this is all your fault, and therefore I don't have to I don't have any accountability or have any have to do the work and can continue to behave poorly, Perla. You just, <laughs> that's a good question. It, see, the reason that they come back with that is because that's been the motive all along. It has to be about blame and fault. But when we shift the sensibility, if you are an I, if you and I are in a relationship, a romantic relationship, I can say to you, I know I'm a handful and I know I hurt you but you physically hitting me is not accepted. And I'm not right. I'm not better. I'm just not going to be here anymore if I get hit. I won't be in a relationship where I get hit. And you could argue back and say, well, it's your fault. And you said this and that. And I would say, I'm not, this isn't a negotiation. This isn't about right and wrong. I don't even know if I'm doing the right thing. I'm just doing the thing I feel. So you shift from being right or wrong to shift to just be you. You shift from saying to the child, this is for your own good to say, this is my boundary. You shift from saying, this is what experts tell me, this is what Dr. Reedy tells me, this is the right thing to do, to this is what I feel comfortable with. And you start to model for your child. So when they go out and get in relationships in the world, they say that to people. We, we, we fail to extricate ourselves from relationships that are toxic and harmful because we're playing the game of right and wrong. When we shift to the, the, the work of just being a self and our boyfriend or our girlfriend, our partner, 
our spouse, our, our, our child abuses us, our response is, it's just not okay with me. I'm just not okay with that. And that's my boundary. And here's the limit. Here's the consequence. Here's the reaction. So it's a whole different way of thinking. And it's a slow turn. They'll be confused at first. And their response, like you suggested they might have, is evidence that the context has been broken all along. Because <clears throat> in a context where people get to be a self, in a context where people get to be a self, people don't argue over boundaries. They respect them. <clears throat> so that's how it works. Someone says, after reading The Knight in Rusty Armor, I had the feeling the story was almost in line with the 12 steps. The knight, realizing his life was unmanageable, believed Merlin could restore him to sanity and gave him his will, gave his will over to him. On his journey through the castles, he took moral inventory. And when he was clinging to the rock, he gave his will over to learn to let go of trust and to trust in it. In the end, he had the spiritual awaken, awakening. Coincidence? No, I don't know how they figured it out, those guys who wrote The 12 Steps. That was a that was a lightning bolt from the sky, but it predated them. The hero's journey that the Knight in Rusty Armor is built on is the work of all the myths that have ever existed, right? They teach the same thing. It's universal truth. It's archetypes. Joseph Campbell uncovered it when he wrote The Hero with a Thousand Faces, when he said, this is what the transformation looks like in life. You get to a point. Read. If you haven't watched the movie Finding Joe, please watch the movie Finding Joe. It's a great introduction to this work. I think the director uh, released it on his YouTube channel. Patrick Solomon is his name. Great guy. Um, watch Finding Joe and it will give you a glimpse into it. And the guys, those two guys who wrote the 12 Steps, they got it all down right. They figured it out. And it's in every myth and every epic story that we know, it's the same thing over and over again. It's just one story. And Joseph Campbell discovered it. Someone says, when parents get grounded enough to do their work and the kids in treatment know that, there can be a phase kids go through where they try and use that like this. If my screw-ups are no different than my family's and if we're part of a simple messed up family, then my, why am I the one stuck here? Yeah, they're trying to have the old conversation with you. The, the why question is nonsense. The why question is the old paradigm. The why question is the defense. You know, when I sent my son, uh, my 18-year-old son, I think it was summer of 2018, I sent him on, a, on his own wilderness experience with service and a deep jungle hike in Costa Rica, or not Costa Rica, the Dominican Republic and some other things. The discussion was this, the discussion was you're going. And he said, what if it doesn't work? And I said, I don't understand the question. It can't not work because it just is what it is. I think it was Beethoven finished playing a wonderful piece on the piano. And somebody asked him in the court, somebody said, what does it mean? And he sat down and played it again as his answer. The new sensibility is not about outcomes. The new sensibility is, this is my boundary. This is what I'm comfortable with. It works in the execution of it. It works because I'm not willing to let you stay home. I've pulled the guilt and the shame and the blame out of the equation. I'm still sending you away. And when they say why, your answer is, because this is what I feel comfortable with. This is what I need. It's in the hopes and intentions letter that we ask you to write, which is, here's what's going on. I love you. Here's what's going on. I, I can't give you what you need, so I'm sending you here in the hopes that you can get what you need. It's what Alice Miller said in her book, the most important book on parenting and children that I know of, the drama of the gift of child, when she said, a mother who doesn't have these characteristics can still give them to the child if only she will allow the child to get it from somebody else. You stop debating right and wrong. You admit that you don't know any better. You admit that it's your best guess. You admit that you might be wrong because you've stopped thinking in terms of right and wrong and being the authority on the matter and you're just an authority on you. 
You've stopped thinking you have to win a debate to set a boundary, which is why people stay in toxic, abusive relationships is because they have to be right to lead and they don't know that they're right. When the real answer was there was never right in the first place. There was just people. So their question is just evidence, just evidence of how the context was broken in the first place. I'll go to, to the upcoming announcements. We have some exciting stuff. Please stay on because I have some really cool stuff coming up. We just did our first online intensive. <clears throat> and I want to tell you, I had no idea it was going to go that well. These are great options for you to attend. <clears throat> Excuse me, I have a cough in my throat, tickle in my throat. We have some openings in the May 15th through 17th. We may have one opening in the May 8th through 10th. I'm going to talk to my team tomorrow about that. So it was in some ways better than the ones that are in person. And it's more affordable and it's over the weekend from a Friday afternoon to a Sunday evening and went wonderful. So excited. Our next Willis support group <clears throat> will be Thursday, May 6th. Uh, I think I have that wrong, Malia. I think the next one is this Wednesday at 6 p.m. Mountain Time. So the slide that I'm looking at is wrong. Wednesday, April 29th at 6 p.m. Mountain Time. Contact Malia at evoketherapy.com for more information or to get the registration. Malia at evoketherapy.com. Our parent workshops are temporarily suspended. We ask you to go to a 612 support, 612 step support groups while you're with us. Any combination of Al Anon, CODA, Families Anonymous, or Adult Children. Alateen is for teens. Go to their websites and you can find information on virtual meetings that they're all holding right now. Refuge Recovery is a Buddhist inspired program of, of recovery, less emphasis on a higher power. NAMI.org, you can go to to get resources and, and classes in your area. <coughs> All of these broadcasts are available on your favorite podcast app. The podcast is called Finding You, an Evoke Therapy podcast. Or you can go to SoundCloud.com on your computer and search Finding You, an Evoke Therapy program, uh, Evoke Therapy podcast. On Twitter and Instagram, you can find Evoke Therapy by using the handle at Evoke Therapy. And you can find at Evoke Therapy Intensives on Instagram also. Search Evoke Therapy Programs on Facebook and the Evoke Family Foundation on Facebook also. Also, our blog has new content each week. Both of my books, The Journey of the Heroic Parent and The Audacity to Be You, Learn to Love Your Horrible Rotten Self, are available on Amazon. All right, folks. Sorry for the tickle in my throat toward the end of the broadcast. Um, looks like I have no new questions. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap up. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for and on behalf of your ch children for your willingness to do the work to continue to show up. It is a heroic journey. It is a heroic effort for you to be willing to look at yourself. You're, you're part of the equation currently, but also your own history and how the, the generational trauma uh, and confusion is, is stops with you. It stops here. So thank you for showing up and showing up at these um I'll talk to those of you who joined me for the parent support group this Wednesday evening at nine o'clock, excuse me, six o'clock, six o'clock mountain time, uh, April 29th, Wednesday. Take care, folks. Have a good one. Talk to you next time. Bye-bye.